Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said he would return when our days parallel the days of noah as we read in matthew 24 37 through 39 but as the days of noah were so also will the coming of the son of man be for as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the son of man be to find out what parallels our days with the days of Noah, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Who were the sons of God who took wives for themselves of all whom they chose? We find the answer in the book of Job. Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Job 2.1 Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The sons of God in Genesis 6.2 are fallen angels, who married and produced offspring with human women, in order to try and destroy humanity by preventing the Savior Jesus Christ from being born. Genesis 6.4 There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Who were the giants that the daughters of men bore to the sons of God? The giants were half-human, half-fallen angel hybrids known as the Nephilim. Just as in the days of Noah when fallen angels mated with human women and the result was a half-angel, half-human hybrid known as the Nephilim, many end-time scholars today believe Jesus will return when human genome is again being tampered with. Satan and the fallen angels not only corrupted human DNA, but also corrupted all flesh, as we read in Genesis 6, 5-13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Are we seeing any signs of genetic tampering in animals today? Are we seeing any signs of genetic tampering in humans today? We're learning about the world's first transplant of a genetically modified kidney from a pig into a human. It made the front page of the New York Times. So the procedure was performed last week at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And doctors say the 62-year-old patient is recovering well. <laughs> The emotions of this historic achievement struck doctors Thursday as they recounted the groundbreaking surgery. It was truly the most beautiful kidney I have ever seen. <laughs> On Saturday, the 15-member surgical team performed a four-hour-long procedure, transplanting a pig kidney into Richard Slayman. The kidney was genetically modified by removing harmful properties that the 62-year-old's body could possibly recognize and reject, while adding human genes to make the organ more compatible. Doctors say Slayman spent seven years on dialysis and had end-stage kidney disease. He saw this as not only as a way to, to improve his own personal life, but a way to provide hope for the thousands of people who need a transplant to survive. Last year, over 15,000 kidney transplants were performed here in the U.S., but there are still more than 90,000 patients on the waiting list. Most people usually wait about three to five years to receive a kidney, and thousands die every year before their turn comes. Every week, we have to remove patients 
from the waiting list because they become too sick to get a transplant while on dialysis. Doctors say if this doesn't work, Slayman will have to go back on dialysis, but that they're hopeful this is the start of a new chapter. Our hope is that dialysis will become obsolete. The kidney was genetically modified by removing harmful properties that the 62-year-old's body could possibly recognize and reject, while adding human genes to make the organ more compatible. Once again, Bible prophecy is exactly in line with world events. As science races to alter DNA and genetically modify animals, the potential to change the human race forever seems just a few years away. Do not be deceived. The sin of humanity has cursed this world with sickness and death. No technology can ever change that. No genetic alteration can bring forgiveness. Only faith in Jesus Christ can. Satan wants to seduce humanity into thinking they can become perfected, godlike beings who can live forever all based on their own ingenuity and strength. Also, the devil can corrupt the image of man further and bring them into rebellion against God and ensure damnation for as many people as possible. This corrupted world is going to end and everything with it. But believers in Jesus Christ will not only live to see a new earth, they will receive a new, perfect, incorruptible body. We do not have to seek genetic perfection, because Jesus has already lived a perfect life for us. It just takes faith in Him as the Savior who died for your sins to receive eternal life, forgiveness, and one day an eternal body as well. 1 Corinthians 15:51 through 55 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Verse 51 tells us we shall not all sleep, meaning we shall not all die. There is going to be a whole generation of believers who are going to do an end run on the grave. We will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. We will receive immediately an immortal, imperishable, incorruptible body. We will be caught up to be with the Lord. At the same time, those who have died, who are dead in the Lord, their bodies will be raised, and the Lord will bring their perfected spirits with them, and they will be reunited, and their bodies will be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18 For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Stay tuned as we watch Bible prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We're going to turn out of Ukraine, a massive attack by Russia overnight in what Ukraine is calling the most devastating attack since the war with Russia began. Absolutely brutal night for Ukraine. It was the largest attack ever on Ukrainian power plants, according to a state official. And in terms of the destruction, we have not seen anything like this before. A vast hydroelectric power plant, the largest in the country in Zaporizhia in the south, on fire this morning. One official warning, they're now at risk of losing that plant. Russia's striking energy infrastructure across Ukraine, launching more than 150 missiles and drones, one of the biggest barrages of the entire war, at least three people killed. And this morning, Ukrainian President Zelensky expressing frustration over the holdup on U.S. weapon supplies, saying there are no delays for Russian missiles. These strikes come after weeks of Ukrainian drone attacks on oil refineries in Russia. And this morning, the Kremlin saying the U.S. should tell Ukraine to halt those attacks inside Russia. Israel minister, we will invade Rafa, even if the whole world is against us. Even if the entire world turns on Israel, including the United States, we're going to fight. 
In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Turning to Israel, Israel will fight through to victory against Hamas, even if the whole world turns against it, including the United States. That's the promise from a top Israeli government official. That pledge comes as the United Nations is set to vote today on a resolution sponsored by the United States. It calls for a ceasefire in the war in Gaza. Paul Strand has the story from Jerusalem. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is making it clear ahead of the U.N. vote that a ceasefire and hostage deal is a top concern for the U.S. There's a clear consensus around a number of shared priorities. First, the need for an immediate, sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. While there could be a pause in the war, the feelings of hostility toward Israel remain, as new polling shows most Palestinians are still on the side of Hamas. 71% of Palestinians in Gaza and Judea and Samaria, known as the West Bank, say Hamas made the right decision to launch the attacks against Israel on October 7th. 94% think Israel has committed war crimes during their current fighting, but 91% do not think Hamas did. In fact, 93% say Hamas did not commit the atrocities seen in the videos of October 7th. But among Palestinians who have seen those videos, 17% believe Hamas fighters did commit atrocities against civilians. As the fighting continues on the ground in Gaza, Israel says it captured some 650 suspected terrorists in the military operation at the Shifa hospital this week, including top Hamas officials. Many Hamas terrorist operatives and senior ones have been hiding in the hospital. And also Islamic Jihad group has been hiding in this hospital. And Israel says it carried out the operation without any harm to civilians, even those working in the hospital. Civilians, doctors, medic teams, none have been hurt. And while Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made clear Israel must launch an assault on the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah in Gaza, Secretary of State Blinken made it clear before arriving in Israel today the U.S. does not support such an invasion. A major military operation uh, in Rafah uh, would be a mistake, something we don't support, and it's also not necessary to deal with Hamas, which is necessary. Um, we're going to have an opportunity uh, next week to uh, share in, in detail uh, that view with uh, our Israeli counterparts and uh, to lay out our views on um, how to deal with the problem differently. But Israeli Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer says Israel will go into Rafah no matter who opposes it. Even if the entire world turns on Israel, including the United States, we're going to fight. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. I have often wondered what could possibly cause America to turn on Israel. I believe the answer is now clear. We're speaking with Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council. Tony, you've been here for a few days in Israel. Why is it so important for America to stand with Israel? What's at stake? I think a lot is at stake. Not only our probably most strategic ally here in the Middle East from a military standpoint, from a political standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint. Mm. I, mean, I, I think America's future is intertwined with Israel's future. Uh, when you look at where America has gone in the last 60 years, as, we, as we've moved away from the Word of God, the ways of God, you know, I think the only reason that God has sustained America is because of our stand with Israel and that we've been a bulwark for, uh, for, for this land we're standing on. Right now in America, young uh, e uh, Christian e evangelicals there, their support for Israel has dropped from about two-thirds down to a third. Palestinian support, five up to 25. Yeah. What would you, if you could speak to that demographic, what would you say to them? Well, one, I would talk, I would start with that first demographic you've talked about. I know why we're seeing this among Palestinians, in part is because of the Palestinian Authority, funded by the United States through UNRWA and others, educating their children basically to hate Israel, anti-Semitic anti information. I've actually looked at the material, I've seen what they're teaching to, to essentially hate Jews, to have maps that do, do not even have Israel on the map. So you look at why young evangelicals are not being supportive of Israel. 
same reason, they're not being educated mm. according to Scripture. So I would suggest what we need to be doing is having our, pe our, our young people, starting with our ch children, reading in the Bible. We're, we're talking about the land that God gave to Israel, to the children of Israel. We're standing in it. In fact, what is called the, the West Bank uh, misnomer that they're trying to give away in a two-state solution is the heartland of the Bible. 70% of the, the events that occur that we read about in the scripture took place there. Israel was given to the Jews forever, and God first made that promise to Abraham, as we read in Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. The promise was then confirmed to his son Isaac, as we read in Genesis 26.3, Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. The promise was then confirmed to Isaac's son Jacob, Abraham's grandson, as we read in Genesis 28, 10-13. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set upon the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. The promised land was described in terms of the territory from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, as we read in Genesis 15:18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God then reaffirmed the promise when he changed Jacob's name to Israel, as we read in Genesis 35, 9-12. Then God appeared to Jacob again, when he came from Padan Aram, and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. As we can plainly see, God gave Israel to the Jews. October 7, a horrible massacre, bad news for everybody, depressed the whole nation here. But what, what's the enemy thinking after October 7th? You've met with important military leaders here. Are we worried that maybe October 7th has had a big impact on their minds, these people who lost so many wars to Israel, but just won such a stunning, you know, horrible victory right. on October 7th? It was interesting because a lot of people ask, how did it happen? How did this happen? So I had a chance to meet with a um, retired general who's still involved in the, uh, in, in the government here in Israel and asked, because he, he said, we, uh, we failed on October 7th. And he said that several times. So I pressed him. I said, what do you mean you failed? You were over-reliant on technology? And he said, yes, we, we, did, we did become over-reliant on the use of technology. He said, but also we became arrogant. And we thought we were strong and that everyone else thought we were strong. And we weren't prepared. And so I think it does open up Israel to a very, I would say, dangerous situation because in this region of the world, and this is something that in America we don't quite understand, is that strength is the currency here. And if you're weak, you're not going to last very long. And so I think it's, it's incumbent upon Israel, number one, to, to do what they're doing, to follow through. In fact, what is called the, the West Bank uh, misnomer that they're trying to give away in a two-state solution is the heartland of the Bible. Seventy percent of the, the events that occur that we read about in Scripture took place there. God gives the most dire warning to the nations who would divide up his land, as we read in Joel 3, 1 and 2. For behold, 
In those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. An escaped prisoner and his alleged accomplice were found and arrested. Police say that Skylar Mead and Nicholas Umfener were found about 130 miles from the hospital where Mead escaped from in a hail of gunfire. You remember the video yesterday, but investigators say this is the bad news here. They may be linked to two murders committed while on the run. Mead and Umfenor spent time in prison together. We know that, and we also know that they're both members of the Aryan Knights. That's a violent prison gang that was formed here in Idaho in the 1990s. Now, Umfenor had just been released from prison in January, and police believe they worked together to orchestrate the escape. The two suspects who we have been seeking were located Maximum security inmate Skylar Mead and his alleged accomplice Nicholas Umfenauer are now in custody just 36 hours after they pulled off a violent escape at a Boise hospital. They were arrested separately more than 100 miles away after a multi-agency manhunt. There was a short vehicle pursuit. There were no shots fired or extensive use of force in this operation, for which we are thankful. Police say the fugitives ditched the car used in the initial escape and suspect they killed two people while on the run. We did find the shackles at the scene of one of the homicides, so that's uh, one of the ways that we tied them together. Investigators say B deliberately injured himself in prison to get taken to the hospital, and when he was about to be transported back, Umfenauer ambushed corrections officers in the ambulance bay. Three were shot in the chaos and survived. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. The little rascals have been arrested. Yes, you heard that right. The gang of three pint-sized bank robbery suspects known as the little rascals, they are now in police custody after their parents turned them in. The FBI says that they were arrested for robbing a Wells Fargo bank in Houston and that they are only 11, 12, and 16 years old. Police say the boys passed a threatening note to the teller and then made off with some cash. Police then released the surveillance photos that you're looking at right now. And turns out the parents of the two youngest boys, the 11 and 12 year old, turned them into police, walked them down to the police station. Investigators, um, you know, they're saying that this case is unusual specifically because they have never seen suspects this young, 11, 12 years old, but then also that 16 year old. A cashier is punched in the face after asking for ID. Watch as these two guys walk into a convenience store in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. One pulls his arms through the sleeves of his white shirt, the other in the blue hoodie trails behind. They make their way to the register. That's when police say the cashier asked for their ID in order to sell them cigars. Police say the one in the Jesus Save My Life hoodie became upset with the request, so he walked behind the counter and attacked. Then they ran out. Detroit Pistons, Jaden Ivey says, Jesus is coming back, urges repentance in press conference. Oh, before we leave, uh, I just wanted to just kind of... Um, 
first, I just want to say that that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, um, and to to any any of you know the world that's hearing this message, um, the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, Jesus is coming back, and we all have to repent for our sins, um, and and we have to put our faith in Jesus. He will come back um, when you least expect it, and you know it's it's, it's time to, to wake up if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.